their meeting of Ketchikan City Council to order. Please call the roll. Bergeron? Present. Coos? Here. Harris? Red. Carlson? Olson? Here. Sievertson? Here. West? Here. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge. I pledge. pledge Whoa. Where do you go? Oh, that's over there. <laughs> <laughs> pledge of Allegiance to the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Rats in a maze. That hasn't been moved in 20 years. Can you imagine the dust that fell Yeah, there you go. Um, that brings us down to communications. We have a request for resolution endorsing the Mahoney Lake Hydro Project. And we have a mayoral proclamation, which is, I shall read. And this is for Emergency Preparedness Day. Whereas residents of Ketchikan community may encounter many different kinds of emergency situations, potential disasters in any given year, whether it can be flooding, earthquakes, tsunami, or wildfire, whereas effective preparation offers the best chance to survive the occurrence and aftermath, aftermath of unexpected disasters and emergency situations, whereas the lives and safety of Ketchikan residents is the highest priority of the community and Disaster management and emergency response are the utmost concern, whereas September is Emergency Preparedness Month in the state of Alaska. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Lou Wims III, Mayor of the City of Ketchikan, Alaska, do hereby proclaim that September 21st, 2013, as Emergency Preparedness Day. In the city of Ketchikan, I urge all residents to proactively prepare for disaster and emergencies by signing up for the flash alert and reverse 911 for cell phones and educate themselves about emergency preparedness by visiting www.ready.gov. Um, is there anybody here to accept this today? Come on up. You bet. On behalf of the fire department, uh, we're happy to accept the emergency preparedness um, proclamation. Um, emergency preparedness is really everybody's job. Um, to be prepared, I guess I'd say. Uh, we respond to the emergency and handle it, but uh, the small things that you can do to prepare in the home, um, in your business and things like that make our response a whole lot more efficient um, and effective when we have a major disaster. In conjunction with um, this month being Emergency Preparedness Month, we're going to be starting a CERT team um, recruitment drive and uh, we'll be looking for information for that coming out uh, to the public here real soon. So we appreciate the proclamation and uh, hope everybody uh, spends this month getting prepared. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us down to persons to be heard. Alan Bailey. Come on, Alan. Thanks for coming by today. Thank you, sir. It's good to see you have your windows open now. You can yeah. pass. <laughs> get a little light in here. That's very good. Um, I just come before you this evening just to basically to give you thanks uh, for the Cooperative Relations uh, Committee, for those who have served on that committee and those who uh, have served up past. When we find common ground, we accomplish a lot between the borough and the city, and, and such as the examples are our, our drive down uh, <laughs> ramp, our, our docks with the stainless steel carts, uh, Whitman Lake, and of course our support for the Swan Lake. Uh, when we find common ground, uh, we lead by example, and we work together in the best interest of the public. Uh, and we combine very limited resources uh, for the most benefit of our of our community. And um, and I think I remember a time when we used to barter and trade and all that. And it, it, I miss that time. I miss that a lot. It seems to have gotten complicated, and sometimes we don't need to do that. Um, I was just commenting to myself and thinking, you know, we're we are really all in the same canoe. We're just in different seats. So um, if I could move on to uh, item number two, 6A general government uh, fire EMS proposal on the table. Uh, from my perspective or from me personally, I believe this is simply a start. It is not the finish of this thing. It's clear that if there are services provided, the borough should be paying for those services. And it, now it's a bit of an issue of how much is those services. And I would like to at least have the door open, have that opportunity that we can begin working together and then establish at some point, uh, and if it be reviewed every year, it should be, 
to make sure that you got you know that the city is receiving fair share of the services and the cost incurred so I'm supportive of that on the new business items with regards to renegotiations of the library debt service I would uh, ask for consideration that that be returned to the cooperative relations uh, committee uh, to help find a solution for the conditions that have been set by the borough regarding the accounting uh, or you know accounting for numbers and all those kinds of things um, we often state positions or we state problems but we don't offer solutions and I would like to find a way to be able to work with the library services and find a way is there some way without cost to the city to make this determination on how we can account for numbers if that is being required you know by the borough rather than getting into a back and forth kind of an issue let's find a solution to this and let's make sure that the library is because it ser uh, is well served as it serves our entire community just not the city so I'm very supportive of the library services I have um, uh, with me and I, I'm sorry I didn't have a lot of handouts I, this is the only one I got actually but it was uh, there's an item on the uh, managers list I believe regarding the ad hoc Dudley field improvement and uh, in that cooperative relations committee we offered uh, any assistance that the city could provide us we're not asking for funding at all but any assistance be it equipment be it uh, advice be it uh, any services that uh, maybe it's some uh, equipment that may be available at the time that, uh, that it be needed uh, Dudley Field is, was in desperate need of for a lot of years of some help and our girls deserve better and uh, so we were able to complete uh, I was able to chair this committee and and uh, a lot of work got done on it in a short period of time and I would like to provide this to you all just for information and uh, if the time ever comes that we can find a way for common ground to help out in that area uh, God bless you it would be it would be needed and and it is wanted if I may give this to Katie mm -hmm. yeah. thanks Alan anybody have any questions for Alan yeah, Alan you have a question yeah uh -huh. Alan, I appreciate your comments today thank you um, one of my concerns when we talk about whether how the whether or how the borough is communicating with the city or vice versa is it seems like when we get KP or the borough management reports we see a lot of comments in there that without further direction I'm going to follow this um, and my concern with the library is I made the motion for us to begin a dialogue with the borough so that the borough and the city could work together to determine if paying for the indebtedness for that um, for the bond is something that we can look at and it seems like the next step was a retaliation on the borough manager's part but there was no direct um, discussion with you guys at the table and there was no direction given by the assembly and so I'm when I read these reports and I see this I have to admit I get angst because I'm wondering are we dealing with another body or are we dealing with an individual and so I, I think that's I really appreciate your comments but when I make comments and I'll probably make some later tonight it's because I see a lot of coming from the borough manager and not from fellow body thank you uh, councilman we have um, again I, I will refer to and I'm a part of that cooperative relations committee and I think it's an important component of our of our community and I think from there we can find solutions and that's what I'm seeing and uh, I, I don't wish to speak for the manager but it is the assembly you know we do have an opportunity to work together and I think we should be doing so thanks I just need one quick verification oh, you you're asking for us today on, on your own I understand but you're hoping the library can go back to cooperative relations and that the EMS be voted on as approved or be sent back to cooperative relations if I have my choice if I had my wand out in in the cooperative relations era I would ask for that to be approved and as a start not as a finish uh, but I understand the issues of, of the money I just I think we have to open the doors first and then let's walk through those doors and afterwards if there's a yearly review I would be more than a, a, a advocate of that you know because it needs to be fair and and we need to pay our share as as would be expected you, you it's the water rates I mean we're you turn on the water somebody's gonna pay for that water 
and it's important to uh, to make sure that we're being fair about this uh, to the city. Again, we are serving our community, and that's what I very much like to. Again, we're in that same canoe together. <laughs> we're just in different seats. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we have John Bartecki. Or Rick. Apologize. Go ahead, John. <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is John Baratke. Um I'd like to talk to you for a minute about a, a new project that I'm, I'm in the infancy. Um, my history is I have been a counselor for about going on 20 years now. Um, I helped start First City Homeless Services. It's a day drop-in center for our homeless and indigent people here in Ketchikan. Um, I, I briefly managed Car House for a while. And I started with an idea a little while ago uh, about an, a project for a transitional living center for probation and parole clients. And what I would like to do is I would like to start the pilot project, excuse me, I would like to have the pilot project here in Ketchikan. Um, I'm not asking the council for any money at this time. I'm just asking you to be open and accept the idea that this is a very needed program. Um, it's needed for the simple fact that we have a lot of people that come out of jail, come home, they reoffend and they get put back in, back into uh, jail, prison to finish their term, whatever the case would be. Looking for a, to start a program to be the buffer between the jail and the community to offer the people, and for lack of a better term, I'm going to call it a hope house. Uh, give them hope, give them direction, and give them guidance. I'm not talking about another a flop house or a place where you know they can just come and, and just do nothing I'm talking about harm reduction wraparound services that are already existing and uh, give them direction give them some counseling services as needed and I just would like the co I would just like the, the council to be uh, yeah they're upstairs I am eventually what I would like to do is I would like to gather some more data and put together a presentation and I would like to invite the City Council to attend that meeting. That's my main purpose tonight. Thank you. Any questions for John? Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I was one more one more question, yeah. Your Honor. I was wondering, would it be possible to get the email for the council members? Where would I get, get that? City Clerk's Office. You give a button, call up. City Clerk's Office? Yes. Fair enough. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Jason. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jason Custer and I reside at 1260 Millar Street. I work for Alaska Power and Telephone and also serve in the capacity as the Chairman and Spokesperson for the Mahoney Lake Hydro Partnership. Um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, address you folks tonight and for including my correspondence in the communication section of the packet. Um, the reason that I wanted to send that letter to you all is because it's apparent that Ketchikan and KPU are considering creative ways that they can provide residents with affordable renewable energy instead of diesel here. Despite the restrictions that are imposed upon KPU by SEPA's power sales agreements. Uh, one example would be the Whitman Lake project. Uh, that project was funded by the state and uh, with the assistance of the borough and the city of Ketchikan. <coughs> uh, in spite of SEPA's existing power sales agreements, and um, you know, to this date, uh, my understanding is that uh, SEPA and KPU still haven't really figured out the true up agreement and how that project is gonna fit um, or not fit with the power sales agreement. So there's an example of kind of trying to work around that get people the energy they need. Um, it also came to my attention um, just about a week ago, and this prompted me to put the letter together, that in January of this year, the city of Ketchikan adopted a resolution uh, uh, directing the KPU manager and city manager to engage in discussions and uh, negotiations with Metlakatla in trying to work out a creative solution and coming up with some kind of power sales arrangement with Metlakatla. Um, I think 
this approach in trying to do this creative thinking and find ways that uh, we can meet people's energy needs here and reduce the diesel we're using, uh, despite paperwork that's in place is commendable. Uh, it shows that your city manager and uh, your KPU staff really want what's best for the community. Uh, they want to keep the lights on and uh, they're not afraid to think outside the box and come up with creative ways to do that and look at all the options are out there. Um, you know, this is kind of what real Alaskans do when they get crowded with paperwork or regulations or you're out in the boat or uh, assembly member Bailey's canoe and the motor brakes or the paddle brakes. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times there's not a lot of resources there, um, but you might have some hooks and um, paper clips and a screwdriver and some things that you can kind of put together a solution to get you uh, to shore or where you need to go. Um, I've certainly been in that situation more than once. Um, so I'm here to recommend that uh, as the city is looking at these different opportunities that it also makes an attempt to collaborate with the Mahoney Lake Partnership in some meaningful ways to see if we can get our heads together and come up with some creative solutions to make this project into a regional resource that benefits the community. Uh, I think that if we're afforded the same opportunity to engage in meaningful discussions and creative problem solving, we may be able to figure out a way to use this to the benefit of the region. I think it's a substantial asset. It has its FERC license and has had the license for 15 years. Most of the project is on property that's owned by Cape Fox Corporation. You've got a road to the powerhouse, um, which can provide the transmission line corridor. It's right smack in the middle of KPU and SEPA's assets. Um, you know, I think if we were able to have some meaningful discussions with KPU staff, uh, we could maybe come up with something. So my, my questions, I've got two questions here. Number one, is the city interested in doing this and having some serious discussions with us. And number two, is the city willing to formalize this intent in a resolution the same way that they did for Metlakatla in January of 2013? So those are my two questions um, and the partnership's two questions. And uh, if the answer to either of those questions is no, um, fair enough but we'd be interested in understanding why the answer is no. Um, so like I said, this is a project that has its FERC license, which reflects years of analysis and stream gauge data. It's about one year away from construction, um, could be constructed in approximately two construction seasons. Um, I was at the Ketchikan Legislative Liaison Committee meeting and um, uh, like a lot of people, disappointed. I'm not sure that I agree with their decisions and I'm not sure if I agree with the process that's used to make the decision. Uh, you know, I think it would be better for the community if the KLL committee uh, or the lobbying executive committee used some objective investment criteria and involved the business community to a greater extent. And I'm a little bit confused by the fact that uh, Saxman's request for 50% construction funding for Mahoney Lake was changed by the committee into a $1 million pre-construction request without uh, consent or input from the project partners. Uh, I, I honestly don't know what to make of that <laughs> and I'm still trying to uh, uh, figure it out. Um, However, I believe that the Mahoney Lake project is an excellent opportunity for our region and it deserves the same level of consideration and opportunities for good old fashioned Alaska style creative problem solving that KPU is giving to other uh, opportunities like Whitman Lake and Mount Lakatla. Thank you and I'd be glad to answer any questions or get out of your way. Yeah. Any questions for Jason? I have some. You bet. Hey, thanks for coming up, Jason. It's been so long since I've seen you. I thought you moved or left town. Anyway, um, I appreciate the questions that you put forth. I think that uh, as a body, we are we, we are obligated to answer those questions because this is a hugely important component of the electrical uh, future of our region. 
and I think it brings up a whole lot of other questions of why we are in support or not in support and I think it, 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 it spurs a larger discussion that needs to happen and uh, from my own personal view I'd love to see this project go forward I mean right now I, th I think the way that we're approaching uh, our electrical needs is incrementally and I don't think it leaves any room for um, large businesses to come in or economic growth so my view is is that we should be developing every every asset that we have now the Catla, you everything that we've got get it online and open up the business say we're open for business here you go so we'll see what we can do with this but I appreciate the questions I appreciate you coming forward well thank you it's it's certainly a resource that's in the boat and it looks a lot like a paddle to me so hopefully we can figure out a, a way to put it to work yeah. Marty has a question for you. Actually, I don't have a question for Jason. I was, could we make this a future agenda item so we could get input from staff? That's what I was going to recommend. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Get answers to your questions. Okay. okay. I, I, if, if I can continue on, I think that yeah. we need to have like an ongoing placeholder on these things and SEPA and everything else needs to come in and we need to be talking about this and rather than just sitting around and looking at each other wondering why we're not doing this. You know, like Mr. Bailey comes in and talks about our cooperative relations. By the way, I really appreciate that, Alan. Really did. And we need to do the same thing to get these projects built. We need to involve our brothers at the borough and get folks involved and get folks off the dime and get this thing done. I'm firmly behind your project. I want to get it built. All right. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Um, Trey. Hello, Trey Atkinson, CEO of Southeast Alaska Power Agency, uh, reside at 522 Sunset Drive. Uh, just quick and short and sweet tonight, I uh, just wanted to thank you for your continued support of Swan Lake Grays. I think that is uh, uh, going to be a very valuable project to the community and everybody will benefit from it. Um, in addition to that, SEPA uh, is introducing a community flyer. Uh, there's kind of a, a gap in communication uh, between uh, our board sometimes and, and the representative communities and uh, to help facilitate that uh, uh, that communication um, I put together a, a community flyer and I'll be I'll be issuing these out to, uh, close to uh, about the same time as our board meetings and uh, hopefully and basically it's just going to be a high-level summary so somebody can take a quick look at it and get a feel for for what are the ongoing activities and such that we're working on. Um, all the same information is available on our website. It's in our board packets, but I figured if I condensed it down so it was a little easier for folks to to, to get a hold of and, and read that uh, maybe that perhaps that'd help. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, okay, fine. You bet. So in short, just a quick two-page summary. Has lots of pictures, shows what we're doing. Uh, hopefully it'll uh, be a catalyst to build upon. It, I didn't include every project that we're doing. Obviously, uh, I was trying to keep it uh, down to two pages. Uh, and we'll, we'll build on that over time. And, and uh, um, if you ever have any questions regarding this stuff, certainly encourage you to go to the SEPA website. And, or, or else you can always call me directly if you want, and I'd be happy to talk to you. I got some questions. Sandra. Um, thanks. Sorry to jump in there, Trey. Um, I missed the last SEPA meeting. I was on vacation. But one thing that has got me wondering is, especially in this challenging funding environment, considering that we don't get any funding from the state or anybody else on the Swan Lake raise, how are we going to approach funding that? What are some of your strategies going forward to keep that thing um, on schedule as if we did have funding? Well. Clearly, uh, we've uh, retained a bond lawyer, and we have full intent to bond the project if we do not receive uh, any state funding. Um, but certainly, we are um, leaving no stone unturned trying to achieve to get funding so we can uh, minimize the impact to uh, um, all the residents of the, of the region. Okay, my, my follow-up question to that is, let's, we're considering the worst-case scenario, we don't get any funding from anybody. How's our uh, friends and neighbors from Wrangell and Petersburg approaching this project, and what is their feeling on SEPA funding this thing 100%, and where should the monies to pay for those uh, 
bonds come from? Currently, they have uh, um, provided resolutions in support of the project, uh, and that will be a decision that will be made by our board, uh, the SEPA board, uh, on determination for, for funding that. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, we're interconnected now. Uh, the three communities are, and there's a little give and take on both sides over time. Uh, you know, we spend a, uh, a lot of money every year improving our core <coughs> access to ensure that we have reliable, available power for all three communities. Some years, uh, some of those monies may be concentrated in one particular area that benefits a particular community. Other times, it may be in another area. And Swan doesn't only benefit Ketchikan. It actually benefits the whole region uh, for various reasons. So. Uh, in short, I think uh, we'll find a solution there and it uh, will work for everybody. Well, that's pretty optimistic. You know, my time on the board, I've discovered that this is an incredibly complex and political organization. And there are so many uh, factors that, that, that weigh in on practically everything. It makes everything very complicated and convoluted. Um, and I was thinking about SIPA today and, um, you know, and all this, it, it, it really makes sense to have one organization, you know, overseeing all of this. But at the same time, when we look at how we set ourselves up, we said that uh, Wrangell and Petersburg gets first dibs on Taiyi water, and so that kind of convolutes things, and then Ketchikan gets that. And so if we're trying to run all of this thing like this and then allocate water per community, it seems like it's, uh, it makes it harder. So I'm still trying to get my arms around see for Trey. It's, it's pretty, pretty difficult. It's really interesting. I think there's room for improvement. And, uh, you know, I really, I, I, I really appreciate the projects that SEPA has chosen to do. Uh, the, the Tai Dam, uh, doing the work on the top of that's going to add storage. And then this, uh, the Swan, uh, raise is really important. And I think it'll go a long way to alleviate if we get the rain and the snow, you know, to, to not burn diesel. And that segues into my next question. How are we looking for snowpack and rainfall? And what's, what's your view on what's going to happen for diesel burn this winter? Well, right now, it doesn't look real good. I think everybody's aware that it's probably been one of the nicest summers for, for a long time. Uh, right now, we don't know what inflows are going to be in October. And those will be critical as they were last year. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I mean, the snow has already come off the mountain. so. Now it's just inflows. It's purely based on inflows, and we're below average. So, um, so get out and do your rain dance. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, as everybody that lives here knows, these weather patterns are cyclic too. Uh, we could roll into next year and have an abundance of water and burn zero diesel for the next couple of years. So we have high volatility in our reservoirs, and that's just one more reason why Swan Lake. Uh, dam raise is so important because it gives us that additional storage to, to really capture those opportunities and, and utilize them to offset diesel. Well, I, I, I certainly think that SEPA is, is definitely grabbing the low line fruit as far as having to increase our capacity in the near term. There's no question about that. I really appreciate the projects that we're doing, and I think we're in the right, going in the right direction. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Thanks, Trey. Thank you. Lillette, are you here? Hi, Lillette Kistler, 637 Tower Road. I'm the chair of the Performing Arts Center Committee. And um, we were kind of bummed last week because um, as I, I understand um, Mayor Williams, your statement about trying to keep the list brief and succinct. Um, we just have a big problem in that if we were number one with Burrow last year and we accepted number four over all graciously and to be left off the list entirely this year is pretty distressing um, and it and it's not you know just from a egotistical we should be there kind of a thing but we have a problem in that if we lose momentum we could lose the project 
um, we're depending on a lot more than um, the state for funding for this project. We have upped our ante um, for our capital campaign, meaning that we're going to get from private citizens and private industry, we are, um, we are looking for a million dollars from them where before, actually to begin with, we had started with um, 500,000 and then we said, oh my gosh, you know, everything's tough, let's up it to 700. And then last year, it, it was awful last year. Everybody knows it was awful last year. It was depressing. Um, so we said, okay, well, you know, we're going to up it to a million now. So our own sweat and uh, trying to find, dig people out of the corners and everything, we're going to try and get a million out of that instead of the original five or seven. Work. And um, we also, um, are depending on Rasmussen for funding as well. Rasmussen will not be first. I, we can't get anything from them until we have underlying that is more than what they will give. So we would love to get 1.2 million from Rasmussen, but if we don't get 1.2 million somewhere else, we're out of luck. We, we won't get that. We have a, a $6 million project that already has quite a bit of funding. Um, thanks to you guys, we, we did get some uh, from the original White Cliff um, that, that kind of frittered down to us there and at, helped us build, buy the building. And uh, we're excited about that. We did finally get first city, city players have a home in there now. It's very difficult. Um, uh, we're heating the whole place with box heaters. 21,000 square foot building we're heating with box heaters because there's nothing else there and we really need to do something about the building um, we realize we're going to have to do some things in stages but if we don't get listed on the priority list I don't think we're going to get any and we're going to lose the support of the people who are willing to give and whether we're number one or number 10, you know, whatever, I think we need to be listed on there. We really um, got lucky. Um, well, it wasn't luck. We, we, we worked really hard last year at the latest legislative um, uh, fly-in and everything else. And, and Peggy Wilson, you know, took some out of her own little stash to give us life giving $125,000 last year. Um, we're going to use that to get our preliminary uh, architectural done. And so that will get us to the 35% architectural where we'll have a really good idea where things are going to be and be able to start looking at what the mechanical can be and uh, whether we can even deal with pellet heat or whatever is the going thing in heat by the time we get this thing built. Um, and then we'll need another 150000 to get to the 65% um, completion on the architectural. And that's when we can actually start doing some work on the building itself. It needs a lot of physical work to it. It's, we're barely holding it together. Um, and uh, But but with that, at least we could get to a stage where we can really start being productive with the building with more money coming in after that. And so we're hoping at least that if we're on the list that we can get enough that will get us to the 65%. We should be done with our preliminary architectural by next July when the funding would come in. But I just think if we're not listed on the priority list that I just don't see how we're going to get any funding at all. So if you can help us out, we'd really appreciate it. We'll discuss it tonight. Thank you. Thank you for coming. That brings us down to anybody else that wants to speak to us, including Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up. Mr. Mayor, City Council members, uh, Doug Ward residing at 1354 Bostwick. 
Road, and I'm here representing Alaska Ship and Dry Dock. Um, and I want to address two items tonight. Item 7.2, I'm sorry, 7.9, new business, which is FY 2015 capital projects, and 9.6, the Alaska Ship and Dry Dock power rate. <clears throat> Uh, we had submitted a uh, project proposal to the um, Lobby and Executive Committee, uh, and uh, it was $7.2 million, and the pro title of the project was Shipyard Utilization, and we had five components to that um, project, uh, totaling $7.2 million. Um, as, as we listen to the debate around the priority um, prioritization of the projects. We looked at the total size of Ketchikan's requests from all of the communities, and we haven't seen all of those requests yet. Uh, we still have the community projects to come in. Um, we felt that it would probably be increase our chances for funding if we uh, made our requests a little simpler. And I got to tell you, the shipyard title uh, utilization wasn't very inspiring to me. Um, so uh, uh, we are changing that and we went to the borough and I, they might have it changed on your list tonight, but what we want to do is title that project uh, for a third land level uh, ship production berth uh, for $3 million. And uh, what that would do, we have two berths now. We have dry dock, the brand new dry dock, and then there's a land level berth with the rails, and the rails go into the new ship building hall. That's kind of a linear uh, alignment of, of uh, things, and if we're going to bring any ships in or out of that building, we've got to clear everything off that open air land level berth. So this third berth will be immediately adjacent to the open air berth we have. Uh, and will allow us to put modules for outfitting there. Uh, there's going to be three new state ferries. They're going to be funded here soon. The two Alaska class ferries and now the Tustamina replacement is a very high priority for the state. And, and certainly for Kodiak and out in the chain. It hasn't had service for quite a while. So those three projects we're going to go after, well, we're, um, we're going after all of those very aggressively. Uh, and having that third berth on the side where we can take and keep work going on concurrently with things going back and forth off that dry dock and across that open air berth is going to give us a bunch of capacity and help us create demand for all of our electrical energy projects in town. Um, I think you know we're getting close to using what we have, uh, you know, and this project was built to create demand for labor, demand for energy, and demand for for new businesses and bigger businesses we have. So that, I wanted to let you know we've changed that uh, and um, uh, um, let you see what you do tonight with that list. I hope we can get through this prioritization list, get this sent to the governor, let's get the community projects in and let's get those uh, adjudicated and then get to Juno and get some money down here. One of the big uh, it's three million dollars to create this open air berth. It's not going to be the building there. It's just going to be an asphalt slab. But right in the middle of that slab is our electrical substation that distributes primary. Well, we receive primary energy from KPU there, and then it's distributed throughout the yard. And it was built in the mid 80s. It's at the end of its useful life. It's overloaded. It's antiquated. It's rusting. The meters don't work very well. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. So um, we also want to use that as a repair berth. So that three million dollars <coughs> is mostly about moving that electrical stub substation out of there, uh, allow us to get this side uh, adjacent side berth put in there, and clear the way for an eventual a large, very large ship repair hall that'll look a lot like the ship assembly hall that we have there later on down the road. Uh, but. Getting that um, substation modernized is going to mitigate any uh, of the negative impacts that the utility might uh, uh, be experiencing from our, when we have our heavy surge loads. Uh, and it'll also be a more efficient 
uh, use of the electric energy we have down there. So that's really what this was about. It's an electrical upgrade for the yard and we'll get an additional berth. But we felt that the legislature would be um, more willing to support creating new shipbuilding capacity in the state than doing electrical upgrades. So that's why we've changed the name. Uh, one other, I just want to touch on this, and John Barati came and talked to you about the homeless issue in town. And we always have been, and even are more so today, an equal employment opportunity in Ketchikan. And that means race, that means gender, and that also means uh, what you've done in your background. We don't do background checks anymore. As a fact, Mayor Kiefer uh, called me not too long ago and asked me if there were any crimes that would uh, prevent someone from getting a job at the shipyard. And I said, well, I don't think so. Let me check. And the answer is no. We don't do background checks. Um, and we've also, so I sent Mayor Kiefer, who's working up at the jail now, uh, an electronic copy of our job application. Uh, I asked him if there's someone that you want to refer, let us know. But otherwise, have him fill out an application. Uh, and I just went out and talked to John, made the same offer. Um, so, uh, and I think that, um, there's a couple reasons for that. One, it's going to be great to end recidivism. And uh, I've seen convicted felons back in the East Coast, a friend of mine who ran a shipyard back there. And um, they, they, they couldn't get uh, a qualified workforce because they were right next to an electric boat company that builds nuclear submarines. And they were taking all the skilled workers from that whole Rhode Island region. So they were hiring um, uh, ex-offenders. And uh, <coughs> those that worked out, that came in, they were absolutely dedicated to Larry Geppert. Some of you have met Larry over the years. Excellent employees, and a couple of them are now running that company back there in Rhode Island. So um, there's a reason for equal opportunity, and that's another reason we have this project here in Ketchikan. So um, and on to item 9-6, our power rates. Uh, we've reviewed, reviewed the power rate. Um, uh, it's gone down a little bit. <laughs> uh, and we uh, really do... Um, appreciate uh, the fact that this community uh, participates in that project every year to the tune of about a million dollars uh, between the property tax relief and the favorable power rate that, uh, that KPU agreed to in the 30-year MOU. The total package results to about a million dollars participation that this community um, provides to this project every year. And uh, that is now mentioned in our capital request. And all of the public documents will make sure that that gets on the ADA project description site so that those people in Juneau uh, have a clear understanding of the commitment that this community has put forth to that project over the years. So uh, thank you very much and appreciate your consideration. Thanks, Doug. Any questions for Doug? I got a couple. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Hey, now that you're bigger, <coughs> tell me a little bit about bigger. Where does Vigor have shipyards in on the West Coast? Uh, seven shipyards. It started in the Swan Island shipyard uh, where my dad built ships prior to the war. Uh -huh. And I worked there back in the uh, uh, 60s. Uh, but it was a Swan Island shipyard is where they started. And they started about the same time that Alaska Ship and Dry Dock did. And they were a competitor of ours. And a lot, uh, Alaska sent a lot of its work down to the Portland shipyard right off the bat because they were very competitive, very, very competitive business. Uh, our, in 2000, we hired a dock master named Adam Beck, and he came up here from uh, San Diego, and great dock master, young guy. My member's wife, Jody, participated in our community. She worked in the chamber and all kinds of community uh, uh, activities. And in 2005, a guy named Frank Fody from Portland hired him away from us. So he went down to Portland, went to work for them, and they took even more work from us. Um, a few years later, they bought the Tacoma Yard, which was another fierce competitor of ours that took a lot of work out of Alaska. And he went up and he ran that yard. In about 
who that would have been around 2007 or so. A few years later, uh, they bought the Everett Yard. They bought a yard over in Bremerton at the Navy base. They have they bought a yard uh, in uh, so another one in the chain where they do pier sides on um, ocean going freighters. Uh, and then just three years ago, they bought the Todd Shipyard. They went from about a 500 person workforce in Portland, uh, and when they and then about in five years they bought six other shipyards and went from 500 to 2,000 employees where we are today. And we are the seventh uh, shipyard in the bigger family. Um, what we now have is a Pacific Northwest Alaska regional shipbuilding industry sector uh, that is going to have the, uh, the mass, the capacity, the workforce, and the infrastructure to compete with the Gulf Coast to build the icebreakers that we're going to need up in the Arctic, the Bering Sea replacement vessels. Oh, thanks for that question. October 5th is the uh, christening of the Arctic Prowler um, uh, down at the yard, and that'll be a, the first modern seal fishing vessel built in the state of Alaska. So you're the biggest shipyard on the West Coast, then? Um, yep. We are the most competitive. And as a, as a group of shipyards, yes, we are. Uh, well, on the West Coast, NASCO's got a pretty good sized workforce, uh, but they do a lot of military work. And they're further south. And that's in uh, San Diego. Right. Okay. Well, the reason I asked that question, what was the impetus in the first place for the power sales agreement with you guys so you would re be competitive with uh, shipyards in Portland the Northwest? And Portland and Seattle. But now Todd. you are the shipyards in Portland and the Northwest. Yes. Uh, and. Can I anticipate your next question? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons, um, well, what we wanted in the MOU and the power sales agreement that you entered into was to provide a competitive rate with Portland and Seattle. And uh, we, it was a very, very challenging um, uh, contract that we signed with KPU to get that in Carl. Your manager uh, represented the city very well. Uh, we ended up just using the Todd Shipyard and the Portland Shipyard as a basis for comparison to get to a competitive rate. But in those communities, they have um, those are power sales contracts that are confidential. Uh, at least Seattle's is. Portland's is so complicated. They, in the Portland Yard, they have something like eight different meters, uh, and it was totally impossible to figure out how to get a single rate. So we went to the utilities, got their rate sheets and things, and uh, Andy and Tim uh, have done a, an awesome job of helping us figure out the complex calculus of figuring out this competitive rate, which averages the Seattle and Portland rates. But we do it using their, their power sales schedules. And Seattle is fairly stable, and that's fairly easy to understand, but Portland changes all the time. There's something like 150 different rate schedules that come in and come out at different times during the year. And um, uh, so it, it was a, a challenge to get there. Um, we have a rate that is competitive. Now that, now that those <coughs> are in our family, we went and said, what, okay, now what's the real contract rate? And it's right about where we are. I, can't, I don't remember the number, but the way we came up, it's it's a competitive rate. Um, so, uh, and one of the reasons for the MOU and the financial commitments that both the borough, the city, and KPU have um, obligated themselves to for 30 years is that we don't have an industrial base in Alaska that can serve the complex industrial needs of shipbuilding and repair. We don't have, and particularly after the collapse of the timber market, what industrial base we had is pretty much gone. And I got to tell you, we don't use too many diamond rings and, and citizen watches when we build ships. We use steel, uh, engines, and propulsion packages, and radar systems, and electricians, <laughs> and things. And you can't find those in this state. You can't find the skills and the qualified people in this state anywhere. 
Um, however, having said that, in two th at the end of 2012, we had 160 full-time equivalents, 98% of which were Ketchikan residents. And so we have, and a lot of them were eight years younger than the average <coughs> age of the U.S. shipbuilding workforce. And we've got 13% women higher, and they're local women, and they're rock stars. They're down there welding right now on that boat. And, and the women are leading the charge. So, um, so I guess the point of all that is that the commitments that this community has made is working, it's paying off, and we're looking forward to the oil and gas industry and the Bering Sea Replacement Vessel Program, uh, in addition to the new ferry construction to create the demand for many, many years. And we, I personally think we can get to that 350 person workforce that we projected back in 1999 with our development plan that, that everybody subscribed to. Thanks yeah. for the question. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Thanks for the answer, Doug. <laughs> Anybody else wants to address the council tonight? My name is Chelsea Goucher. I live at 436 Main Street, and I'm here on behalf of the Greater Ketchikan Chamber of Commerce. And I'm just here today to urge you to support the decision made by the Lobbying Executive Committee to include someone from the business community on, on the committee, specifically someone from the Chamber of Commerce. I think it's a great idea. The Chamber has a lot to offer in the way of the talent of its respective members, as well as our unifying impetus. Our motto is progress through unity, and we represent a huge, vast array of businesses here in Ketchikan. Most of our businesses are in all different fields, and many of our business are, is, businesses are in direct competition with one another. So it's always a fine line to walk, and that's something that we're very aware of. If I'm not walking that line, I'm not doing my job. If the board of directors aren't walking that line, they're not doing what they were elected to do by the membership, membership either. So it's something that we're kind of used to doing and that we have to do. And I think that we can bring that to the table with the municipalities to work together in cooperation to kind of formulate some kind of objective, standardized criteria that we can use to evaluate these community projects and figure out what is going to work best to kind of raise the water line for everybody in the community in the greater Ketchikan area. So I just urge you to uh, support. I think there's a motion on the table for new business under 7-9, and I just would urge you to support that. Unfortunately, the borough assembly didn't take any action on the, uh, the decision made by the lobbying executive committee at their meeting on Tuesday, but that's all right. We're not in a hurry. We understand that the process is well underway for fiscal year 2015, so we just kind of want to throw this out there and have everyone start thinking about it, and we'd like to get involved in the process early next year so that at this time next year we're not all sitting here thinking about the same thing in the same way. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Chelsea. All right, anybody else wants to address the council tonight? Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you, everybody. That brings us down to consent agenda. Um, I only had, I think I had a couple I wanted to throw out there. Um, item 7A, six and seven on the Miller Street one, and then um, both um, KPU ones, one and two sole source things, I believe. Mr. Mayor, yeah, 7A6 is one I definitely want to talk about. Okay, we'll leave it out, um, and we'll just leave them both then. How about the KPU ones? Seeing no objection, we'll do the KPU ones under consent. Do we have a motion to consent? Yeah, right, move to consent. Yep. Moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, can you read the items? <laughs> Approval of minutes, regular meeting of August 15th, 2013. <clears throat> Resolution number 132520, appointing the election officials for the regular municipal election to be held on October 1st, 2013, and appointing the member of the Canvas Board as well. Liquor license transfer, Captain's Keg to Williams Incorporated. E-waste recycling event exempting the procurement of SCADA <coughs> maintenance equipment from competitive bidding and written quotation requirements, Open Systems International Inc. 
um, sole source procurement of project management and contract installation of antenna, waveguide, radio, and related materials at Mount Hayes, BC with, I apologize, Guaitel of Queen Charlotte, BC, Canada. Indefeasible right to use microwave tower and shelter capacity purchase and agreement with Guaitel of Queen Charlotte, BC, Canada. All right. Follow roll. Harris? Aye. Coos? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. West? Yes. Olson? Yes. First round. Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. That brings us down to unfinished business. 6A1, which I meant to put on a consent agenda, sorry, since it's second reading. Um, do we have a motion? Yeah, Your Honor. Go ahead. I move the City Council approve in second reading ordinance number 13, 17, and 32, amending subsection D of the Ketchikan Municipal Code, section 1310030, entitled Imposition of Passenger Warfage Fees and Establishing Effective Date. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Anybody want to talk about it? Call the roll? Yeah, I, I have a couple okay. of comments on this one. Is, is Steve in the room? Steve, come on up. So if I'm reading this correctly, we were considering getting rid of a dollar of our warfare fee. Is that correct? It comes up every so often, yeah. So have we found some major economies in our operations, Steve? Uh, Port and Harbor's Director, Steve Corporon. Um, there's, <coughs> there's two issues here with this. Number one, if we, we take that dollar away, um, they're still going to pay a, a dollar that's going to go to Anchorage or it's going to you know, go up to the state because it's whatever was in place when they, when they lowered the head tax to that certain level. It's whatever was in place at that time, that's, that's what is on the books. Um, we've met with Cruise Line Agency a couple of times. Um, I'm working on my budget right now, and we have uh, items identified for the next four or five years. Uh, to help improve things in their operations. I, I can't see in four years that we're going to have economies that's going to allow us to, to, to reduce our warfage fee. And, you know, I, I think for as an informational thing, I'd like you to bring back, if you guys could, what the warfage and dockage fees are for some of the cruise ports, like like all of them, and so we can get an idea. Yeah, of, yeah I provided uh, that last year when you asked that same question. I'll just dust it off. And just dust it off, okay. turn it out, throw it out there, because I think it's it's interesting to know, at least it's it's my understanding, is that we have some of the lowest dockage and warfare fees on the Western Hemisphere. Um, I mean, there, there, might, there might be some obscure place that um, maybe doesn't even read a, a dot or a name on the map, but, you know, so I, I think when we talk about these things that we need to be taken with a little bit more seriousness than what we're doing and a little bit more understanding, and that's why I brought it up. Not having looked at the numbers since last year when I put it together, uh, one thing I, I will caution you on when you get these is that it's a lot of apples and oranges. Because a lot of the ports wrap, uh, they bundle everything. It will be a certain rate, but that includes water. That includes... Don't we include water? You know, what's that? Don't we include water? We charge for water yeah. separately. So you, you'll get a bunch of different rates. Right. And, and it's, it's very difficult to compare them. Um, because many of them are bundled. So, but, but, yeah, I have a spreadsheet I put together last year. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll give it to the manager uh, for your next meeting. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Yes, sir. All right, call the roll. West? Yes. Olson? Yes. Bergeron? Aye. Harris? Aye. Sewardson? Yes. Coos? Yes. That passes six to nothing. That brings us down to 6AB, or 6A2, fire and ES. EMS dispatch services for North and South Tonga service. Do we have a motion? Your Honor, I move the City Council accept the August 28, 2013 proposal from the Ketchikan Gateway Borough for the City to provide fire and EMS dispatch services to the North and South Tonga service areas at a cost of $7,500 each for each service area, total cost of $15,000 annually, and direct the City Manager to execute the agreement on behalf of the City Council. Second. Moved and seconded. Sam, do you want to add to it? Yeah, I do. Um, first of all, I want to thank Alan for, for coming up and talking to us. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that one of the reasons that I've served on the Borough Assembly and City Council and all the other things that I've done was try to get our community to work together. I think that we've taken this issue and put it out there and vetted it. We've we found out what they're willing to pay, uh, what they think is fair to pay. And I think that we should probably, we have a different opinion, but go with that. See, I'm a city resident, but I'm also a borough resident. And so let's just imagine and say that we reject this and then we're going to go out and do our own fire and EMS. Well, 
as a city member and a borough member, I normally get to pay for this one, but the boroughs as well. And that doesn't make any sense at all. And so in the continuation of the brotherly love to which we are <laughs> trying to get to, I am going to vote uh, in the affirmative for this motion and continue on with our, our good cooperative relations. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. I agree with you. Anybody else want to speak to it? Matt? I, I just have a quick question. We keep hearing or in reading $7,500 was the offer that was never rescinded. Can I? Can we get a brief history, Dave? Just I, My understanding is the $7,500 was the initial as they were getting started and was supposed to be renegotiated. In essence, that 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 is, that is correct. And then the there was uh, several discussions back and forth relative to how the um, amount was derived, whether it was based on a percentage of calls north, percentage of calls south, or as uh, as a um, operating cost of infrastructure, if you will, um, as as far as having something that, that was always there. Um, the, the assembly uh, had had approved the the original amount. Then the things changed. We ended up having some protracted discussions, if you will, somewhat publicly, um, and it came back to the point of basically this is what the borough assembly is willing to pay, and it's my, I'm asking the council if that's what you're going to find acceptable. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, and I believe along the line. The borough went out and checked with other communities to see what they could provide and that's what my interest was to see what the market value was and they were pretty close to the same number when they came back yeah all right okay. go ahead we get ever get an estimate or an acknowledgement if they needed additional equipment to help at one point it was said that they needed equipment and infrastructure added to avail them to be able to take part in that i don't have an answer for that yeah, I, I believe that, Matt, you're correct. Um, if they were to go with the services from up north, they would have to change their communication system uh, at a one-time cost of whatever that was going to be. I didn't get that number, but it was fairly expensive to start with. Uh, Matt? I, I was, I have to admit, and you're going to hear comments library during the li or later during the library discussion, I'm, I'm becoming very frustrated with the communications from the borough manager. And I, I alluded to it earlier, um, but I really appreciate Assemblymember Bailey's comments, and I'll, I'll support this, but I think part of what's happening here is we're not being allowed to discuss this in the Cooperative Relations Committee as the elected officials. And um, I think we need to make sure that we're taking those opportunities, borough and, and city representatives alike, and not allow um, very bold statements of, of one or the other to start controlling our discussions. Thank you. All right. Sam? Just, just a, as an afterthought here, I, I think that the city and the borough has propensity to get into <laughs> some heated public debates, and I want to be the first one to say that I don't relish those at all. And I think that when we sit down in the same room one to the other that we can probably come up with, uh, with a solution that would be satisfactory to everybody. And again, I really appreciate Alan coming forward and continuing that. Uh, that, that Thank you. All right. All roll. Sievertson? Yes. Bergeron? Aye. Coos? Yes. Harris? Aye. Olson? Yes. West? Yes. Okay, that passes six to nothing. That brings us to new business item 781 Economic Impacts of the Visitors Industry in Ketchikan, Summer 2012 McDowell Group. Patty, you're going to take it away? Thank you, Mayor Williams and members of the Council. Patty Mackey, President and CEO of the Ketchikan Visitors Bureau. And as the Mayor alluded to, um, we are presenting to you the findings of the economic impact study that was done for the uh, tourism industry in 2012. Uh, part of our efforts as a marketing entity are we do a lot of research, of course, to keep up with what's going on in the industry what visitors are thinking and, and certainly um, how the industry is impacting the community. We haven't updated this particular study since 2006 and the reason for that is it's typically an economic impact study is done every couple of years but as you all know 2008 
moving forward was not one of our better years from the uh, from an economic standpoint. Um, we felt it would be a waste of effort and money, quite frankly, um, because that was also the time that we started losing ships um, out of the state. So we waited until things started to even out, and so. Um, the study is here for your review. Uh, it was included in your packets, of course, and, and really the, the major points of the study are, are presented in the executive summary at the front of it. Um, there's copies, additional copies uh, electronically available through the Visitors Bureau. If anybody wants them, they can just contact our office and we'll be happy to send them. Um, the major differences in this particular study versus the one that was conducted in 2006 really has to do with the municipal revenues that are being um, accounted for. This 2006 study was prior to this imposition of the statewide head tax, and it was also uh, during the time that the city's own passenger fee was in the three to four dollar range instead of the seven dollar range that it's been in. Um, so that has helped uh, tremendously because really the passenger counts have not really risen that much. And as you will see as you review the study, um, the spending, if you consider from 2006 to 2012, uh, the value of the dollar, uh, the spending is actually not really increased in value. Uh, but the magic number is $183 million that's attributed to the visitor industry in Ketchikan. Of that, $154 million is being spent by our visitors. Another $25 million comes from cruise line industry spending in Ketchikan, so goods and services that they purchase for their uh, their use uh, on board the ships could include anything from a repairman going to fix a vending machine to, uh, you know, buying all the vanilla ice cream at one of the local grocery stores because they didn't count accurately when they left port. Uh, there's also another $4 million that's attributed to crew member spending. Uh, and to break those numbers down just a little bit further, 84% of that uh, $154 million that I mentioned earlier is attributed to cruise passengers. They spend almost $134 million a year. Uh, that breaks out to about $161 per person during their visit. 12% uh, is attributable to the air um, traveling passengers uh, at about $18.5 million. Ferry passengers contribute about 1% of the overall visitor spending at $1.5 million. Um, and as we've discussed many times, of course, the air visitors who typically spend three to four days on average in Ketchikan, uh, they end up spending about $675 per person per visit, uh, while ferry passengers spend about $401 per person. Uh, of the crew spending, uh, that was estimated about $3.6 million uh, based on a number of roughly 23,000 crew members getting off the ships while they're in port in Ketchikan. And that comes out to about $157 per crew member per year. Um, and there uh, is additional information in the study relative to jobs. Uh, the industry represents uh, 1,550 uh, jobs in 2012, 1,150 <coughs> 45 of those being direct jobs, another 405 that are indirect as a result of the industry being here. And they represent roughly 15% of our total employment. Uh, so with that, I would be open to any questions you might have, but um, just happy to have updated, fresh, new information and, and pleased that we can share it with all of you. Uh, we've presented this information to the assembly as well, so I hope that it's useful um, information for you moving forward. Go ahead. Go ahead and answer it. Yeah. Thanks for coming up, Patty. It's a great report. It's really it, it's heartening to see that we're doing so well in the visitor sector. Uh, my only comment is is that nothing against the McDowell folks at all, and, and don't don't misinterpret my comments. But I'd like to see somebody else do the same report and see how the numbers come out and see see what their perspective is. We always, you know, McDowell has got a great name and all of that, mm -hmm. but I just want to hear somebody else do it for once in a while. Well, we could certainly look at other um, vendors to do the report. And uh, I can tell you, too, you know, as far as the methodology, yeah, most of the information comes from other reports McDowell's done. They were commissioned to do right. a very extensive report for the cruise lines. But keep in mind that they use a nationally recognized program, IMPLAN, which is known across the country for determining economic impact. I didn't so. say it was wrong. <laughs> I just 
and it might cost a little more, but we can discuss that at budget time. But okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you, Patty. Oh, Dick. Yeah. Hey, Patty. Uh, on page six of that report, I read something that was stated. I'm curious about if there are any reasons why, and it says. Uh, Visitors appear to have less propensity to spend during their cat scan visit. Uh, what, compared to, and I think it was compared to Juno. Uh, page six, and it's about the last in the middle of the last paragraph. Yeah, and that uh, Council Member Coos, that goes back to what I said earlier about this, just the value of the dollar being what it is. That um, we're just we're seeing less value even though the the number actually kind of went up from 156 per person to 161 but not significantly but overall over the course of the last six years they're not increasing their spending by leaps and bounds okay, well, the way and the way I interpret that was when they hit catch can they're less inclined to spend money because of is it catch can or is it so they already spent their money but I know there's northbound southbound so it, that makes a lot of difference to a lot of people what they're doing but it's just, are they willing to spend money, more money in Juneau than here? I don't know. Well, I think, again, I, I still think that, you know, we could certainly get McDowell to clarify that, but I still think it's more along the lines of what the value of the dollar brings and the fact that that hasn't gone up um, no in rates. recent years. No. But in answer to your question, they do spend a, a considerably more in Juneau, and, and part of that is because of the port time. You know, we've talked about that before. Juno ships are in port 10, 11, 12 hours sometimes because their travel distances to their next ports of call, be it Glacier Bay or Skagway, are so much shorter. Yeah. And so we kind of lose out there, especially on the southbound uh, sailings because then the ships are contending with tides and getting their passengers back to Seattle in a Canadian port stop and on and on and on. Um, it, but interestingly, in other reports we've done, we've seen that the retail spending in Ketchikan is much stronger than it is in Juneau. In Juneau, the tour spending is the majority of dollars. Um, and that's the helicopters and stuff. True. And they can get, they can actually get a couple of tours in while they're in port. Yeah. 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 Uh, and one other question on page 10, it, it shows the employment. And it, it always puzzles me. We'll show total employment, but other than, and it doesn't matter whether this is visitors or or even the seafood industry. But to me, it's important that we try to differentiate between full-time people and seasonal mm -hmm. and and I and I guess part of that struck home the other day when I was uh, bringing some passengers around. And they said, "You know, you're the first person that lives here that we've seen or talked to." <laughs> and it shows how many people that come into this town on a seasonal basis to work. And it would be, I think, interesting to us to look at that and see if there's a way that can we increase the local employment. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I don't know whether they can split it out on who's seasonal, who's not seasonal, maybe even who are resident and non-resident. True. I know that so. the... Um it seems to be the, that they're kind of moving away from FTE type of um, accounting yeah. in these surveys now. And, and I'm with you. I would much rather know, you know, how many jobs equal one full-time year-round job here. Um, but, but that's something that they find very difficult to track. If you remember when the Workforce Development Board was here earlier this year and met and toured around Ketchikan, um, you know, there was quite a bit of talk about seasonal employment. Um, I would tell you that most employers in the tourism industry do like to hire local. There's just so many advantages to that, not the least of which are housing and training and getting them familiar with the community. Um, but there is really a shortage of people that are either have the inclination to work or are eligible to work. And um, you know, at the Workforce Development Board, it was sadly uh, pointed out that you know there were a lot of people that couldn't pass a drug test. And in tourism, there are a lot of jobs that require you to be able to do that, whether it's a CDL, uh, driving a boat, um, or just preference on the part of the employer. So um, I believe that it's true that, that in the summertime, whether it's fishing or tourism, I think everybody in Ketchikan who wanted to work could probably get a job. It's just that we don't have enough people really wanting to work or that are qualified. And that's unfortunate because um, the industry would tell you that that would be their preference, would be to, to be able to hire locally as much as possible. 
All right. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That brings us down to item seven eight two. We negotiate the agreement of payment for the payment of funds to the city of Ketchikan for library services, Ketchikan Gateway Borough. Um, do yeah. we have a motion? Uh, go ahead. I move that the city council slates a discussion of the library funding on the September 5th agenda of the Cooperative Relations Committee and that we have Ms. Lyshaw attend in order to address any questions or concerns that members may have. Second. second. Is the meeting tomorrow? No. no. The, 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 meeting, the meeting was moved to the 20th. Yeah. Thank you. To the 20th, right? 20th, yeah. Thank okay, you. Okay, correction. To the 20th. We'll make that. Did we have a second? Second. And a third. Okay. Bob, did you want to say anything? No, I think that, uh, well, I guess a little bit in fact that I think that we do need to sit down at the table and discuss this as a cooperative relations committee. Uh, and uh, uh, as Matt alluded to, in some places it may be appropriate for those uh, the um, debt service to be rolled in. In some places it may not. But I think we need to have that discussion at that table um, openly. So um, that's where it belongs. Yeah. Yeah, just, just a comment. I, you know, I think the way this has worked in the past has worked out pretty well for both the city and the borough. It's to me unfortunate we got to here because every borough resident pays the debt service through the sales tax. And uh, without saying any more about it, we'll let the Co-op Relations Committee work through it and come back. I would agree with Dick. I, I'm on that committee, so. Um, <laughs> call the roll, please. Oh, Oh, Matt, you want to say um, I'm sorry. I just want to address a few things that in the in the manager's letter. Um, th this was something that, as a member of the committee, I saw firsthand, and it was the fact that borough assembly members and the borough government were very highly, um, very vocal and visible members of that of that committee. They were. Their input was not only asked for, it was listened to, and the library was amended, and the building was adjusted, especially with, I mean, Assembly Member Phillips was very vocal, and he was a very strong member of that committee, and resulted in how that library was shaped. And to, I, I understand the issue that borough members had no um, opportunity to vote on it. But we set a priority that the library operating costs would be paid for by both residents, and I think we need to continue that. I think it is only fair. Um, but the things that really disturb me in here is that the statement that, you know, while, while I agree that they did not have an opportunity to vote, the statement that the borough had no control over size, location, or any other characteristics of the library are just quite frankly not true. As I said, Assembly Member Phillips were the, was there. The head of planning and zoning and transit were there. They were part of the um, meeting where we toured all the sites, and they were able to put, express input. Um, and while debt service for it is supported indirectly or directly by city sales taxes, we've established that the library operational costs, and that includes in any entity that you enter into the cost of your building, is part of your operational cost, and I think this discussion needs to take place. There are other aspects in here when we talk, when the borough manager talks about um, inflation statistics, he's using the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics online calculator. Yet, if you go to the Alaska Department of, of Labor, the state of Alaska Department of Labor, you find that the um, the costs or the inflation represented by the 159,707 in the original agreement would match up with $430,603. So we can control and look at data all we want. What we need to do is, again, come to some resolution on this as elected officials and as a body. And I, I do think it's fair to have this discussion. I mean, we've, I've had discussions back and forth with this with several assembly members who have thought it was a good idea at the time. Things might change. However, it's a discussion that we need to have and not one that, again, needs to be driven by um, what I quite frankly perceive as a way to completely offset the cost of almost every borough 
facility or not facility I'm sorry any any way that they utilize or that we that they utilize city services or that we utilize city services as we've seen <coughs> where we have reduced our tax income in certain areas so that their employees have less workload and I think the borough needs to or the borough manager needs to look at these and I think the borough assembly needs to look at this and we need to have a good discussion a good solid discussion that has a good hearty debate and and I I fully support the borough and the borough residents picking up some of the tab of that fund. Anybody else? Call the roll. Harris? Aye. Olson? Yes. West? Yes. Bergeron? Aye. Sievertson? Yes. Coos? Yes. That passes six to nothing, brings us down to seven eight three award of contract thirteen twenty one. Design services for phase four of the birth one and two replacement project. P and D engineers, do you have a motion? Okay, Your Honor. Go ahead, Jeff. I move the city council to approve contract number 13 21 design and services for phase four of burst one and two replacement project in the amount of not to exceed $149,700 between the city of Ketchikan and P and D engineers incorporated and authorize the funding from burst one and two replacement capital account. And direct the city manager to execute the contract document on behalf of the city council. Second. Who didn't second? Dick, do you want to add anything? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's pretty explanatory. Anybody else? Matt. Your Honor, apparently I'm very vocal tonight. <laughs> um, I just want to point out we're again asking for zero percent. And if we, we're going to spend $131,000 on this, including roughly about $100 per hour for. For labor, labor, including labor from um, P and D, in terms of office assistant, they're charging us at $100 per hour. If we would have hired an engineer in house, this would take, according to P and P and D, half a year time. I don't think we'd be spending $131,000 for six months of work if we had hired somebody on a term contract. So, just something to consider during budget time. Thank, thank you very much. Call the roll. Bergeron? No. Sievertson? Yes. Olson? Yes. Coos? Oh. Yes. Harris? Yes, ma'am. West? Yes. Okay, that passes five to one. That brings us down to seven eight four proposed removal of I'm not sure how to pronounce waste said <laughs> stairway. Schlafen. <laughs> That's why it needs to go away. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor. Go ahead. I move the city council the authorize motion. the city manager to red staff to dismantle and remove the remainder of the Schlafen Way stairway, leaving the existing right of way in public ownership. Second. Sam, do you want to say anything? The name says it all, Your Honor. Um, Dave, does this um, go up to that the house up above? Is that how they utilize? I think it terminates in that backyard. In that yard, doesn't it? Is that their only access, though? And I imagine I you guys don't are believe so. Thanks, Cliff. Good evening. Uh, Cliff Allen, Public Works and Engineering. Uh, the name, I think, came from one of our residents who used to live there. I struggled with it as well. Uh, yeah, it terminates essentially in the backyard of, uh, of an upper building. Uh, it is not their only residence um, or their only access. It is also not used. Uh, both ends of the structure have, have accumulated debris. Uh, we boarded, boarded this thing off. Uh, last spring I think it was and we've never even had a phone call wondering why much less a complaint that someone lost access we've notified all owners uh, we further notified our emergency services to verify this was not uh, in any way used or dedicated as an egress in the event of uh, fire emergencies or other access issues how long this has been unused I, I can only speculate I'll round it to the nearest decade and say about 30 years since this thing has ever served a purpose uh, it's a liability that we really need to be free of. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. You bet, Bob. Cliff, do we have any utilities in there? We do not. No, none known. No. Uh, <laughs> and I say that honestly. Yeah, I know. Uh, because uh, every time we, we dig in a street, we find surprises. Yeah. None known. Okay. Call the roll. Harris? Aye. Coos? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. West? Yes. Carlson, oh, Olson, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, the passes six to one brings us down to seven eight five. Your Honor, go ahead. Break, I need 
You bet. Let's take five minutes. I just go until somebody comes up.
Is everybody here? Yeah. Yeah, I'm back. He's still. All right. Yeah, okay. And we got a window. Where did we leave off? Are we on number five? five? We're done. Okay. We're on the contract 1327 Peace Health Ketchikan Medical Center subdivision authorization to negotiate terms and conditions with Dow HKM. Do we have a motion? Your Honor, I move the city council to authorize the city manager to negotiate terms and conditions with contract number 1327 Peace Health Ketchikan Medical Center subdivision with Dow HKM. That contract will be brought back to the city council for formal consideration. Second. Bob, do you want to say anything? I think there's just a lot of stuff that needs to be cleaned up out there, and I think uh, Cliff can allude to that with the way the property lines are laid out and everything else. So um, before we move further, any further into this project, we better get those things squared up. <laughs> and this will do, Dave, will this will let us do the transfer then completed? Or? Of the gateway buildings to Aquila, correct. Yep. Thank you. All right. Call the roll. Sievertson? Yes. Bergeron? Aye. Coos? Yes. Harris? Aye. Olson? Yes. West? Yes. All right. That passes 6 to 1. It brings us down to item 786, award of contract 1322-1217 Miller Street Demolition Burnett Construction, LLC. Do we have a motion? Yeah. Sure. Bob? I move the City Council award contract 1322-1217 Miller Street Demolition to Burnett Construction, LLC, in the amount of 166000 $450 establish a 10% contingency and the amount of $16,645 for a total contract cost of $183,095 approve a budget transfer in the amount of $92,095 from the economic development parking fund portion of the abatement of dangerous buildings capital account to the Miller Street abatement project approve funding in the amount of $183,095 from the 2013 public work street division Miller Street capital account and direct the city manager to execute the contract on behalf of the city council. Do we have a second? Second. second. Moved in second. Bob? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I know this that this project came in well over the engineer's estimate, but it's a fairly complicated project when you look at the electrical and the plumbing and the amount of boom truck time and putting a riprap and removing debris and stuff in the creek. Um, and we do have the monies available. Um, and I don't think we're going to get a better bid if we were to put this off and go out for another RFP. Anybody else? Sam? I will defer to my good friend, Mr. Sievertson, that was not happy about this. I wanted to toss them all out and rebid it. He's probably had a chance to look at it more than I just took the numbers and threw a tissue, but I'm good. Anybody else? Dick? Yeah, the, yeah I, I, probably the same comments. It bothers me that uh, we're so far under with our estimates, and uh, I've heard a couple of maybe logical explanations, but I make a comment, and I may be short on memory, but I can remember when Mr. Leibman was building that bridge and he volunteered basically for a smaller price to take that thing out for us, and we uh, did our typical game of uh, playing right around the Rosie, and we didn't do it. We could have been out of there probably at third the price, so we got to be careful about, I'll use my words, playing right around the Rosie with people, so Bob, we'll go from there. Cliff, would you like to bring anything up? I see he's sitting down there. <laughs> I know that it, it, the price has gone up, but uh, looking at the bid structures and what came in, I think that the, it's a little more complicated than just taking a building down with a backhoe at street level. It is. It is. Uh, for what it's worth, this particular estimate was, was developed by our own staff in-house based on unit prices from other demo projects like the Bodden uh, 420 Water Street. Uh, estimators use square foot averages out there. This is a strange animal in its own right. There's, there's uh, not a lot of projects suspended over an active creek uh, to give a, a project history. I think some of that is also borne out in the uh, the spread on the on the other numbers. Uh, they vary. It just went black on me. They vary quite a bit. Uh, I think the low bid was 166. Touch the screen. I did it. <laughs> not in time. Uh, the next one was 188 and another one was 289. That's a big spread on the numbers, uh, which tells me the contractors are a little uncertain on how to approach this. Uh, all due respect to the contractors, too. Um, when bids are, are, are hammered out, it's often at the last minute. Uh, what our staff did, uh, and, and I can, can state this uh, you know, quite the, with certainty, too, they contacted KPU. 
and, and truly <coughs> drafted an actual estimate of staff hours and equipment necessary, say, to do the electric. Um, and again, I'll do respect to our, our primary contractors. Most of them did an arm wave, uh, let's throw a big number in here on electric and cover that. Uh, and that far exceeds you know, what we have from an actual price. Uh, and there was an even bigger spread on those numbers. Uh, now this could imply there's just a lot of work out there and, and uh, prices don't have to be all that competitive. Maybe next year we'd do better. I don't know. I don't think we came out that much better when we, we did a secondary <laughs> bid on the bottom. Uh, in our own defense, I'll say we opened the project yesterday on Creek Street. Uh, five or six bidders, four of them were really, really tight. Uh, I mean, really tight right at to the engineer's estimate. I mean, differences of a few thousand dollars on, on, on a project that's in the hundreds of thousands. That's how we like to see it, of course. This one, you know, again, there's just not a lot of uh, uh, bid tabs out there for this type of thing. So is there arm waving on our hand, too, trying to come up with estimates? Absolutely. Thank you very you much. Your, your estimate was a wag. <laughs> <laughs> Portions of them are. I, I will not deny that. That's why it's called an estimate. It would be nice if we could go to the contractor and say, what are you going to charge us for this? But, you know, no one's going to tip their hand and say, here's my number, use it in your estimate so the other guys know what to beat. Um, We'd just like to know what we're working with here. It's a challenge. Thank you, Cliff. All right, call the vote. <coughs> Coos? Yes. Bertrand? Aye. West? Yes. Harris? Aye. Sieberton? Yes. Olson? Yes. Okay, that passes 6-0. Oh, that brings us to item 7, contract 1322, acceptance of the easement documents for the 1217 Miller Street demolition. That's the um, stuff we need so he can do the work on some um, issues on permits and stuff. So do we have a motion? Your Honor, I move the City Council accept the temporary construction access permit easement agreement and permanent easement associated with the 1217 Miller Street demolition contract and direct the City Manager to execute the documents on behalf of the City Council. Second. Moved and seconded. Anybody Your want Honor. to talk about it? Yeah. Honor. Go ahead. I see that Mr. Burnett's in the audience. I didn't know if he wanted to say anything to the council. Are you fine where you're at? Or Okay. Good. Let's give you the opportunity. Okay. Call the roll. Harris? Aye. Olson? Yes. West? Yes. Bergeron? Aye. Sieberton? Yes. Coos? Yes. That passes six to nothing, brings us down to seven eight eight contract twelve oh four solid waste recycling and handling facility expansion design. Do we have a motion? Your Honor. Go ahead. I move the city council approve contract number twelve oh four solid waste recycling and handling facility expansion design to Terratech Inc. for uh, pre designed services in the total amount of sixty five thousand nine hundred and eighty six approves the funding from the two thousand thirteen solid waste recycling and handling facility building extension and design capital account and authorize the city manager to execute the contract on behalf of the city council. Second. Moved and seconded. Bob? We've been needing an expansion up there for a number of years. Uh, even while I was working there, we were working on trying to figure out how to do that. So I think this is a good move to move ahead with it so we can look uh, into the future of doing more. Anybody else? Call the roll. Bergeron? Aye. Sievertson? Yes. Olson? Yes. Coos? Yes. Harris? Yes. West? Yes. All right, that passes six to nothing. It brings us down to item nine, 2015 Community Priority Capital Projects Request for Submittal to the Office of the Governor. Um, we do have a um, revised item from the borough. Um, do we have a motion? Your Honor. Go ahead. Move the City Council concur with the 2015 Community Priority Capital Project Request as recommended by the Lobby and Executive Committee on August 13th, 2013, and amended by the Borough Assembly on September 13th, 2013 for transmittal to the Governor. Do we have a second? Second. Um, Matt, take it away. Um, I think it sounds like the list uh, got very thoroughly vetted. I'm, I have to admit I uh, am a little surprised that we all, or that the committee altered the Mahoney Lake request from Saxman. However, I think inclusion of the Performing Arts Center is a necessity for that project to go forward. So. Anybody else? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I think it's outrageous that the, the, the committee did anything with the hydroelectric project from, from, from Stocksville. I think that, you know, if they put a number out there, prioritize it, 
to my knowledge, I don't think this has ever been done before. How would you feel if they, we were to have this project and they go, well, now nah, we're going to drop it down to a million dollars and place your fifth on the list? And I just don't think that it shows uh, the respect that uh, a sovereign entity like those guys have, and I don't think they should have changed the number. I mean, they could have thought that they, you know, they, they should have gone back to them before they did that unilaterally. I don't support it. But, you know, they can put a $23 million request in there and put it fifth on the list, but, you know, the number that they put out there is the one that, that, that should be on the list, I think. Well, what happened, um, and I think Joe Williams, the mayor, acted quickly and took the switch that I would was okay with the change because it wasn't going to make the list at the 23 with uh, with the people there at the meeting. So um, going back to the 1 million and trying to get some more money to keep um, working on it and getting it um, squared away on hopefully on pricing and what they can offer. Um, so was Joe the best was there? Mm -hmm. Joe Williams was there. He was there. So you guys yeah, it was, um, you know, it was uh, okay. definitely the top issue. Sounds like I <laughs> guess it's all wrong, so I'll just, everything I just said, just forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Marty. Your Honor, um, a little less concern. Is there any way to add It's anything? on there with the bureau's added. Oh, okay. okay. It's number nine. Okay. All right, good. Bob? And yeah, I, I still think that we've got to be careful in going forward with the budgetary issues of how many priorities we put out there, um, because if you have a bunch of them, you really don't have a priority. And, and when speaking with the governor and, and looking at what's happening up there, uh, when you look at our priority list, um, I'm concerned about how far down that we're actually going to get. So that's just a comment. I'm going to support the, the motion, but uh, I think that we need to think, you know, um, in a more condensed fashion to community priorities. Dick? Yeah, uh, probably there's, I, I'm like Bob, there's, we get it too long. And we get things on here that uh, I guess in my opinion probably aren't going to go anywhere anywhere so it's kind of a waste of our breath but uh, that sort of being said I think the committee did vent things pretty good everybody including Saxman had a pretty good say about it and, uh, and everybody wasn't happy but uh, the one thing I'm concerned about from the city standpoint there's a project on there that was out of CVP funds that was uh, the uh, them all over there behind the lumberjack show and I think somehow or other staff needs to work with the lobbyists to make sure that gets it shows up somewhere because it's a different kind of funding that has probably a great opportunity to be funded for us and we need to get it fixed and so I, I don't know what the process will be but I think it can get done without being on this list but Ray can probably deal with it for us we need to get it done did you hear that Dave yeah. thank you I do have another yeah. comment. And I, I certainly appreciate the perspective of having a short list, and, and but at the same time, when we have the folks from the Performing Arts Center come in and say, "Look, hey, like we were number one with the borough last year, and this year we're not even on the list," I don't think that's serious. I think that's a disservice to them. And if uh, I, th I think that the Performing Arts Center, whether it has a reasonable chance to be funded or not needs to be on the list, it needs to be on the radar screen, it's an important community project, it's a project that people have been working for for a long, long time. And if you if you look and see what these guys are doing out there, I mean, they're, they're doing elbow grease, they bought the building, they've done a lot of stuff, we've helped them, but, um, you know, I think that we should put the Performing Arts Center back on this list. And I would uh, make a motion to it's do It's already this. on there. It's already there. Yeah. Number Where's nine. it at? Nine. It's on the new revised one from the borough. Oh, I don't have the new one. Where is it? Yeah, it's on the back of your hand. No. It's number nine. We're there. All right. Um, go ahead. Just maybe just a comment. The book still goes to the, to the legislature. Yeah. It's going to have yeah. a laundry list, and, and they can pick and choose their favorites. And it may not have no logic to it, but uh, it still goes. <laughs> <coughs> All right, let's call the roll on this one and see if we have an error motion. Before we move on, didn't we have like 20 projects on it last year? No, we just did the top. Seven. We did the top seven Six. or eight or seven. something like that, and then all the other ones didn't work prior to us. That, that, were below it, so there was the, that the, many. <coughs> but we have a prior top priority of you know the first eight or nine. It's not that I'm one on this committee or anything. I'm just trying to understand. <laughs> <laughs>
Collar all. Plate is full. Harris? Aye. Coos? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. West? Yes. Olson? Yes. First round. Aye. And that passes six to uh, mo uh, one. Do we have a motion for number one, which I'd love to talk about? Yeah, Your Honor. Number, yeah. I move the City Council support the recommendation of the Lobby Executive Committee to appoint a representative from the Greater Kitsukan Chamber of Commerce to the Lobby Executive Committee. Do we have a second? Second. Who did second? Dick? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I support this, and I think probably a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is a number of years ago, the Chamber was probably the leader in running this whole lobby and exercise in Juneau. And we were two governments participated and it kind of floated away in the last two or three years. And I, and I think somebody outside the elected body helps. And then the other thing I would I would say is that uh, right now the way that lobbying committee is set up, there's eight people on it, so you can have a tie vote, which caused a problem last year. A ninth, uh, I don't think will make a lot of it'll it'll make an untie vote. Or an even even number so that there's not a tie vote, and uh, I think it'll it'll bring in a little bit a little bit different perspective, and I think we'll end up with the same good products we have. So I, I don't think there's any downside to having a chamber member on the committee to recommend recommend to the community. I Bob, Matt had a hand up. Oh, Matt, go ahead. Uh, first, um, we don't have that recommendation here. Somebody at the meeting give us a little bit of it I don't know I don't see I didn't see any um, discussion about it so oh it's just right here what was the discussion just centered around that it should include that um, what was brought to us by the chamber and um, the committee um, was in support of it so it's being directed back to um, each body to see if there's um, unanimous um, approval on that I, I know I, I suggested including an additional member at our last meeting and I really do support that because an odd number of people, at least you get to a 5-4 vote <laughs> and, and and something comes out. But I I don't like the idea of limiting this to one uh, one particular <coughs> community group. I like the idea of having this open for anyone in the community to participate, whether it's someone who's a member of the chamber who is a very vocal and um, an up-to-date member group, but we also have a fisherman's group, you know, commu community. We also have an arts community. We just have such a diverse community. I would hate to take our 10,000 adults and limit that to only, I don't know how many members the chamber has. 500? It's closer to 250. Okay. I, I would hate to take 10,000 and go down to 250 because I think we reduce greatly. A, the number of people that we can pull from, and B, the, the background and the, the diversity that we can gain on this group. So. Uh, Bob? Yeah, um, you know, I don't know if I'm willing to support a vote on this right now, and the fact that there are discussions, as was brought out in the newspaper, about Saxman thinking about going a different direction, which will definitely change the number of those on this committee. And I'm not sure what the, like, like Matt was saying, what the makeup is. If you start putting individual groups from the fishing community or something like that, then you get a little bit more of a special interest group trying to work their priorities into it. And this is, we represent all those as uh, governmental agencies trying to move forward with either economic development or arts or whatever it may be. Um, so um, I would like to defer this until this thing kind of pans out. So we, we've got time before the next. Uh, session of this uh, as we go forward. So, um, before we defer, Bob, can I have some comments and we'll go back to that motion? No, I, I think that we should defer it for a while until we see what pans out. Are you making a motion or are you going to? Well, I think there was already a ma motion made, so. To defer. I'd move to defer. Do we have a second? Hearing none, we'll keep moving. Sam, then me. Thanks. I would have supported the motion, but I, I, had, I had some customs about what the, what the makeup. Again, I'm a neophyte with the lobby and executive committee. Isn't it just made up of uh, elected officials and yeah. staff members? Yeah, but it used, originally it was the chamber that ran the whole thing, and I guess the chamber is interested in getting more involved, which I, you know, trying to pick who's going to be on there with the, the three different communities and everything I think would be difficult. Um, 
I think I like the idea of the chamber. You know, they're community oriented, and um, it makes it easy. If we're going to ask if Saxman's still on there and the borough and us, and then we have to sit there and decide who's going to be the ninth member. Well, who 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 votes on it? Is it is it Dan and Carl and everybody? The members there's three city members, uh -huh. and there's three borough members, and there's two Saxman. So there's staff people. There's a staff for each manager's on there. Um, Joe, the mayor out of Saxon's on there. Um, two borough assembly members, me and Dick, and Carl. And this was throwing the history like the chamber did before. Then the borough came up with a um, idea, and then all the groups agreed to it. And um, you know, it's just sort of a work in progress if we want to make changes each body has to deal with and you know bring it up and agree to it and come back I think one of the outcomes that we should be pushing for is an odd number and Bob yeah. brings up an interesting point that uh, Saxon was talking about going into uh, another uh, representative group to, to, to do their uh, capital request and, and so that could get us down to an odd number and so we, we need to make up because, I mean, if, if we were eight, I could just imagine what it was like if we had eight people on here. <laughs> We'd never get anything done. So it needs Dick, to be an odd number. Well, Dick and Marty. If Sackman does exercise their right to not participate, it's still an even, even number, three, three city and three boroughs. So we still need the odd number. Okay. Okay, Marty. Uh, I appreciate Matt's concern. My office is across from the Chamber's office. And that is a really diverse group of people representing a, a, a lot of different industries, private and nonprofit. And I think it, it makes a, an orderly way to get that ninth member on there. So that's my feeling about it. All right, well, let's see where we're at. Let's call a roll on this and see if we got support or not. West? Yes. Olson? No. Uh, Bergeron? I'm not ready, but. <laughs> 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 Do, do, do. I'm going to vote now. Harris? No. Sievertson? No. Hughes? Yes. Okay, that fails 4 to 2. Um, bring it back. Yeah. I'd like to, um, you got a motion, Bob? I'd like to defer it until after budget. No, I guess. Um, let's just um, rec um, go ahead, Pat. I move we. Let me kind of put this in. Go ahead. Um, defer this to the Cooperative Relations Committee for discussion of new proposal for being at the Reefer. 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 Thank you. <laughs> no, wait. Re. <laughs> okay. Wait, what's, this, what's this about Reefer? <laughs> <laughs> okay. The motion is to send it to the Cooperative Relations okay. Committee so the borough and the city can talk about um, doing this and who. Um, they would like to be a part of it so far. That's because a part of the Cooperative Relations Committee. No. 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 Do we have a second? Did second. we get a second? Okay. Call the roll, please. Sievertson? Yes. Bergeron? Aye. Coos? Okay. Harris? Yes, ma'am. Olson? Yes. West? No. What's the sure. count on that? <laughs> that is five to one. Are you sure? Five to one. Okay. I am. So it has been sent over. Um, I hope, um, well, you know, the borough was pretty, I mean, the members there were in support of it. I'm hoping um, we can come to something on that quickly. All right, that brings us down to something important. Let's do the vouchers. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor, I move for approval of vouchers to the Kent Ken Daily News in the amount of $970.49. Second. Moved and second. Call the roll. Hughes? Yes. Bergeron? Aye. West? Yes. Harris? No. Sievertson? Yes. Olson? Yes. That passes. Yes. Fairly. Um, that <laughs> takes us down to manager's report. Dave, do you have anything to add? Um, one thing that I would add that uh, was brought to my attention today, um, you might remember that uh, last year we had the discussions and ended up moving the bus stop from the corner of Grant down here down to this end. Well, throughout the way that things have worked this year, uh, the, there's been about five different times where the bus, the tail swing on the bus has had it hit the fire hydrant that's right there. <laughs> so what we're going to do is, is, is we think that by moving that bus stop one parking space forward, we can eliminate that and then it'll just be, uh, you'll, it would be a net loss of one parking space down here towards this end. 
but given the congestion and the uh, pedestrians and such in the area, it's going to be the better way to go. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Dave? Seeing none, that moves us to city clerk's file. Um, just a question, Your Honor. The council mentioned wanting to have a, um, a presentation or whatever on the citizen participation thing that I had suggested at one point. And I just want to know if people want to come to my office individually for that or if you want a presentation in council meeting. What's the? I know you're excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see it done at the council. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Okay. We'll do it here. Do we want to come a little bit early to a council meeting? It should be pretty brief. No special meeting? <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not my book, but you can call it. Get something organized in October. You told me the 15th? Did I tell you the 15th? You did. Oh, then 15th. <laughs> or the 19th. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Decisive, no. All right. City attorney's file. He's not here. Where is he? Uh, future agenda items, anybody? Mayor and Council comments. Dick? Uh, none, Your Honor. Sam? Um, just I had an amazing vacation. and it was I can tell you're full of energy. I, I know. I just, <laughs> I'm actually really glad to be back. It's nice to see all you guys. I'm having fun tonight. Probably a little less careful than I should be. But, um, if you've never taken a cruise because of the uh, the amount of business that we do at the cruise lines, I think it's really enlightening. And I, I had an opportunity to go on a two-week cruise, and I went to, I think, like 10 different cruise destinations. And I went on tours. I got to see how their uh, tour operators operate cut route. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it was it, it was really enlightening. You know, and, uh, it's... Uh, and it was an amazing trip. And there's this place called Kirkwall, Scotland, that has worse weather than Ketchikan. I know you don't believe that, but it's true. And, you know, the guy says, this is the first calm day we've had in three weeks, and it was like blowing 15. <laughs> <laughs> he said it blows like 140 miles an hour in the winter there sometimes. There's no trees at all. Even the grass leans over. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a windy place. All right, Matt. But, uh, I'm glad oh, to be sorry. back. Um, and we talked about uh, the hydro development. I think it's time that we start putting some placeholders in the uh, agenda and having some earnest conversations about how we can bring these projects forward and work together with SEPA and everybody. I mean, we need to start sitting down and talking about, hey, this is how I think we ought to do it, and then come up to a consensus and make a plan forward. Thank you. Matt? I've spoken enough already. Bob? Yeah, we did have a SEPA meeting. Um, I think SEPA has put uh, some engineers in the field on the Net Island at this particular point to start doing some hydro site analysis with the uh, state grant money that we had, and they're going to be looking at more sites. Um, they've been working on Tai, they're putting a weir in up there, BAM construction um, went up, and through manual labor, removed a whole bunch of logs, drilled into the rock, and they're going to start pouring concrete tomorrow morning with helicopters from Tai. So that project is moving forward fairly well. Um, I think that we're still working with the initial agencies on the uh, uh, Swan Rise. I think that's all going real well. We're being held up. Uh, the Forest Service used this as a model and says this is the way that you should do projects, uh, which speaks well for our staff at SEPA and what they've been doing with them as far as getting ahead of the curve. Um, and I think uh, other than that, everything seems to be running along fairly smooth. They're, uh, looking at a reactor for the uh, uh, Wrangell area. Uh, we have one that is deteriorating and they need to replace it and they have a plan to do that. Uh, they're about ready to go out for uh, procurement and get, get that project. Hopefully it'll be finished up by the end of the year. They're still working on the um, power line corridor to go out to Cake to provide them with some power. It was interesting talking to the Mikowski office. They went out there um, for the discussions and they went to the gym there was one light bulb on in the middle of the gym they were fumbling around in the dark looking for chairs and stuff and they said at night you could tell exactly what room everybody was in because that's the only light that was on in the house so at 65 or so cents a kilowatt hour um, they're very conservative um, I there was uh, good conversations about um, 
the movement towards the true-up agreement that we talked about earlier here, uh, I think that they're fairly close. The city and SEPA have been meeting, and uh, there's some language issues they want to talk about and some calculation stuff, but I think that they're getting closer and closer on that. Everything I hear is positive from both sides, so I appreciate that. But it was a good meeting. Um, I think we got a lot of stuff uh, done. Wrangell and Petersburg were well represented. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, bud. Oh, by the way, the front of the building looks wonderful. <laughs> I was so busy today, I haven't even seen it. Marty? No. KJ? The only thing I got to say is money. It's all about money, kids. And Always is. I just want to remind everybody, the city's a little short. We'll be all right, I'm sure. Tags. All right. Um, anything else, KJ? No, no. All right. All right um, our push for the hospital bond um, election started off. I've, we've hit both rotaries. We've hit chamber. And there's other outfits and just small groups that I'll be talking to. And um, I encourage you guys to talk to everybody here in the city, borough or not. They might have friends in the city and stress the importance of this. We've had great, great involvement from the uh, um, medical community. We had three or four doctors up at the chamber event and they're just expressing the needs and concerns and it's um, it's really good to have them there to um, talk about it so I thank them the only thing else I have Dave um, I had a resident up there from Summit and Forest he says that um, they're having a bear problem up there okay. and um, he says it's the certain houses they're not taking care of their garbage cans and he was saying um, you know we have a thing to give them a ticket but nobody ever gets a ticket and he was concerned, um, and it wasn't my regular Forest Summit guy. <laughs> we'll, we'll take care of it. So if you could look into that, I told him I'd at least bring it up to the meeting tonight to management. Okay. I have take care of the bear, or are you going to take care of the garbage? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and then CPAC <laughs> sent a letter for support, wants one. wants one, and they want me to sign it, and I was wondering if it's okay for their, um, for a grant for? Wind. Wind, that's it. Um, I have not seen the show. Yes. Uh, and um, if you guys don't have a problem, I'll throw something together and send a letter. Quick comment, Lou. Yeah. Um, I think it's a wind gauge. I think I'd like to get get off the dime and get that wind gauge up at the dump. There's no place in the whole, on, the, on the island that has better wind turbines than that place. It's near the power lines. I mean, it's on the road system and it's got great wind. I mean, I've been up there where it's 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 amazing. That could that could so not, one, one urban could solve yet. all of our problems. So <laughs> let's get off the dime. All right. Um, so you know, objection, and we'll take care of that. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? Yes. We do. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. If you need another, come borrow the